This is Judy Knight. I'm with PLMA, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today and to let you know that this is a load management dialogue. And here you will discover practitioner perspectives on flexible load management, demand response, distributed energy resources, and also managed charging. Today's session offers an overview of one of the award winning projects from PLMA's 20th awards, which we uh, made in the spring of this year. And so we are pleased today to be able to welcome Salt River Project and also its partners, Energy Hub, Google Nest and Resource Innovations TechniArt to provide a description of their award winning program, which was called Bring Your Own Device Program for Hard to Reach Customers. They will tell us a little bit about the program and successes as well as the lessons learned. And uh, now it is my pleasure to invite Meg Campbell of Guidehouse, who is one of our three uh, PLMA Awards co-chairs, to join us on camera and to say a few words about the PLMA Awards and to introduce our presenters. So Meg, take it away. Thank you, Judy. Um, so today we will be talking about Salt River Projects. BYOT DR program for hard to reach customers, which was awarded a PLMA program paysetter award. Um, so first, I just want to explain what the program paysetter award is. Um, it is one of three PLMA awards, and the program paysetter award really recognizes programs that support and deliver flexible load. It acknowledges innovative solutions as well as unique program designs and delivery that are really paving the way to effectively manage load and support the integration of distributed energy resources. Uh, so Salt River Project's BYOT program won the Program Paysetter Award for really showing huge success in breaking down the silo that typically exists for hard to reach customers in BYOT programs um, and really connecting with them and converting them to a participant. So. Uh, a regulator utility um, or a marketer may receive a PLMA pay setter award, uh, but oftentimes a team receives it. Um, as we've seen in the industry, teamwork is the dream work. So today we're going to hear from uh, SRP and the team of vendors behind the success of the program. So I'll go ahead and do a quick introduction of them now. Uh, first off is Eamon Ure, the Demand Response Program Manager at Salt River Project. Tyson Brown, the Manager of Strategic Energy Partnerships, Partnerships at Google Nest. Uh, Jesse Guest, the Strategic Client Success Manager at Energy Hub. Um, and Jim Walsh, the VP of Sales at TechniArt. As we move forward with today's presentation, we invite you to type in any questions into the chat box and we'll do our best to get to those during the Q&A discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, and with that, now I'll, I'll go ahead and welcome the speakers. Um, and Eamon, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Meg. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to speak to you here today. Um, we have got an exciting topic to talk about. It's a, it's a great way to go and talk about um, future public-private partnerships that we can do within the industry, right? So we have some uh, great resources in Google and TechniArt and Energy Hub to be able to go and get these products out to our customers, get them enrolled in the program and participating in the program. So if we want to go to the next slide. Um, overall, um, as you can see here, we've got a big, huge word map out there, right? So it depends on uh, where you're looking at from a customer perspective and uh, where you're at. But overall, SRP continues to maintain exceptionally high customer service, especially for our residential customers and our CNI customers here in the Valley. Um, we've continuously go and strive for excellence. Um, it's one of the big things that we get from our CEO, Jim, and um, you know he does an excellent job of kind of leading from the front. And we're able to go and get that out to the customers as well, and that reflects within um, our scores that we get from JD Power and Associates. Uh, next slide. So overall, um, one of the great things about the program itself is that we are trying to break down both internal and external silos. So for years. Um, we, everybody's tried to go and build demand response programs right on the residential side. Um, one of the great benefits is, is that it's been able to go and greatly expand, provide more megawatts to our supply and trading teams, provide load reduction to keep our grid stable and reduce our environmental impact um, from having to use uh, carbon based resources during peak load days. Um, one of the things that we did see overall when the, within our participants, right, when you actually broke down 
um, the customers and their demographics, we did see a lack of participation from low income customers. So in talking to to Jim and Energy Hub or Jim over at uh, Techni Art Resource Innovations, talking to Tyson, we said, hey, how do we go and reach out to those customers, right? So it's coming up with a way to do outreach to low income customers and the way how we defined our low income customers for this particular segment is that ideally um, they're self identified. So we have some customers on what's called an economy price plan. We have customers that self identify themselves in a couple of different ways through some third party organizations. And then, of course, um, we were able to go and look at uh, HUD census track data, look at those zip codes and uh, thus make those customers eligible based on HUD census track and, um, and demographic data that we have access to from a federal government standpoint. It's public to everybody, so you can feel free to go and look at your utility, see how many customers you can possibly draw into. Um, currently, in terms of households, we have about 60,000 households, almost 85,000 thermostats enrolled in our program. Um, began the overall BYOT program in 2017, and uh, we're well on our way in the next year or so to get to 100,000 thermostats uh, underneath uh, our control with uh, the DERMS Mercury software that we uh, use from Energy Hub. Uh, next slide. All right, so as you can see here, a little bit of an eye chart, right? It's kind of hard on some slides. Um, you know, some of us nerds and dorks love this stuff, right? <laughs> For everybody else, what does this mean to you without uh, having to put readers on, even if you're below 40? So um, with that, on that note, um, right? So the customers, right, see classic thing, you know, the ducks on the top of the water just doing their thing, but obviously below the water, there's a whole bunch of churn, right? So what that means to everybody on the background, right? is that, hey, customers want to be able to have a program that works for them. It's seamless. They want to be able to enroll, right, and get there with that. So that means participation, enjoyment of the program, you know, even if it's in the first hour and they're like, hey, in that second hour, let me go and tune out. We're still getting a huge impact, right? There's a lot of information that goes on behind the scenes into there. And I think that's kind of what we want to talk about is that how through partnership with Google, how partnership with Energy Hub, and Techni Art Resource Innovations that we can go and grow this out. So we'll kind of go and move past the eye chart for half a second. And we'll kind of get to the meat and potatoes of this thing a little bit. Or, you know, if you're like me, you got to go and be a little leaner on the meat and potatoes nowadays. But, <laughs> uh, you know, strokes are different folks, right? Um, so I think this is a great time to have Jim kind of talk about what we came up with, uh, some ideas behind the kit. Um, and how that's executed, because I think that's a really important point to emphasize is that having a seamless ability for a customer to type in a code, click, get the kit in a very linear way. We've had a lot of experience with, um, they, 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 they do get a coupon code. Yep, so we'll get to that here. I just saw that come up in the chat. Um, but we've experienced over the years when we've had customers enrolled through a conventional program where they go and purchase a thermostat, go to go enroll it. If there's multiple clicks involved, you see uh, customer enrollment fall off like a rock, right? So we did everything we could from the beginning and the get go um, to eliminate as many clicks as possible, um, little barriers of the entry, other things like that. Obviously they have to look at the T's and C's and a few other things, right? It's just one of those requirements, but uh, good time to talk to, to Jim from RITA and uh, let you go from here, sir. Great, thanks, Eamon. So. And is right, the, the main focus of this program was certainly centered around demand response and the thermostat is front and center. It's the largest device on the page here, but there's some other devices that we put into the bundle that made it attractive and more of a well-rounded package for customers who wanted to participate. Lighting still provides savings in a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, even in jurisdictions where lighting is not captured uh, for energy savings, it provides a good marketing tool for customers to participate because they know that it changes the comfort level of their home. The hot water measures uh, in Arizona provide a pretty big savings, uh, so those are bundled together. And the, to answer the coupon code question, you're essentially there now. So this is the landing page where the customers come and they enter in a single, uh, it's a one-time use unique to that customer coupon code. So those coupon codes are provided to the marketing engine for this particular program, which was the um, SRP team and we also did 
it was digital and direct mail. So the coupon codes are sent out to each individual customer. They come here and use it. We let them know that it's a one-time use code, so don't share it with your neighbor if you want to participate in the program because it's only going to work once. And it allows us to track some of those marketing initiatives and find out what was working effectively and what was not. Below the images of the products is a bunch of questions, just frequently asked questions that customers might think of as they're considering participating in a program like this. Uh, we just wanted everything front and center, let them know exactly what it is they're signing up for, transparency in the offer. Um, if we skip to the next page, please. This is where the customer completes the transaction and they can click either one or two thermostats here, a very quick, e-commerce transaction, as Eamon mentioned, the more buttons you push, the quicker it is for people to disappear off the page. And the point here is to help customers get through this transaction as seamlessly as possible. There's a few fields on the checkout page where we ask them to attest to participating in the program, agree to the T's and C's from SRP, agree to the T's and C's from uh, the Google Nest uh, OEM page, and get them out as, as quickly as they want to get out. There's lots of information they can read. There's lots of opportunities for them to learn more about what the participation uh, parameters are. And the backside is just making sure that we have the right customers signed up for the right program and the shipping information is also applied or the address is applied on the next page during the checkout process. So a relatively quick transaction for them, but there is a host of information. After they complete the checkout process, there is some additional resources that we built into the process, like an installation support page, which um, Eamon will talk, we'll jump back over and talk about some challenges associated with getting customers to, to install. Uh, the SRP team do, did a great job asking a series of questions to participants to find out why they might not install the device. And then we built an installation support page to try to alleviate some of those pains for the customer and make it easier for them to do the part that they said they were gonna do, which is hang the thing on the wall. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there for a minute and we'll jump forward and, and um, yeah, keep talking about the rest of the customer journey. Two, two quick things um, to, to piggyback in on that is that um, so the customer coupon codes, right? We did a lot of different um, iteration, right? We, we thought, hey, let's go out for an email campaign and we let's do a flyer, right? So we did some initial things that were just a flyer, right? So it's just a printed off sheet that you know it looks glossy it looks nice but as everybody knows i don't know about you but i know about me and a few of my neighbors you'll walk down to the mailbox you'll go get it right and you're kind of flipping through everything and you'll just put it all into don't need to read this just toss it in the recycle and i'll open these three or four things right um so that had a little bit of a work we just didn't have the time to get it into an envelope and then we transitioned into putting the offer into an srp envelope so that way the customer sees them like oh great, now I got to look at this, right? Well, they open it up. It's a nice, pleasant surprise. It's a description of the program. It has all that one side's English, one side Spanish, coupon codes right in there. It's just a simple one sheeter, giving them good news, but it forces that action of opening up that utility envelope, right? Because typically people aren't just going to toss it unless it looks like junk mail. Um, but then that's a nice, pleasant, you know, approach, right? Some customers who did an email campaign that works well for them, they've got that but a lot of customers in this demographic either don't have a smartphone, don't have access to regular email, right? Don't have an ability to get on the internet, type in the code. So we made it in, you know, approachable in every different way. Uh, they can call TA, help them with the code, right? They can get in there. Um, the other thing is the question that got asked here from Kevin in there is that, no, we did not put this behind a customer login because a lot of people, frankly, heck, I have to go back into my password manager on my phone to log back into my SRP account, right? So we didn't want to put things behind those little barriers um, there. Yeah, to answer Jan's question, yeah. I'll jump in. I'm surprised yeah. that I was able to make it 14 minutes without talking. Um, so I'm patting myself on the back for that, if anybody knows me. Um, but no, I agree with Eamon. So having that omni-channel approach, it makes it such that irrespective of like what your preference is for being engaged with, there's an opportunity for you to create that pathway of engagement but also the utility form works significantly better than a post, the standard postcard for the reason that Eamon mentioned, like the authority that utility has, typically you, there's two organizations who send out, hey, don't fall for scam, like emails and notes all the time. It's your utility and the IRS. The reason for that is because those are two authorities where people are like, if they ask for money, I'm probably gonna give it to them. So because of that, 
if you get something in the mail from a utility, you're going to open it up because you've got two thoughts in your head. You're either like, I thought I paid that or, oh, man, I got to pay that. So then you open it up and you get the pleasant surprise of not only do I not have to pay anything, they're giving me something. So you don't need to put anything negative on there. It, in and of itself, it'll be a surprise because there's already a negative connotation likely coming because they got something in the mail from the utility, right? And then it's a positive uh, experience moving forward. Whew, went 14 minutes. Ah. <laughs> All right, I'll let you jump in, back into it. So this is the end of the customer journey uh, where the customer checks out and then there's attestations and T's and C's. So if we jump forward to the next slide, I think there's a uh, some more data here and I'll let him speak a little bit to the uh, the program goals, participation levels and what we're thinking about for the future. And he'll have uh, some components for me to jump back in as well. Yeah, and I think this chart is a great way to look at how we did that iteration, right? You can see obviously in um, right around Christmas time, we we're trying to get it out around Thanksgiving before the holiday uh, flyers and everything else went in. But that's just the logistical issues, right? That you go into with these programs is that yeah, we have maybe have the best ideas in the world, but you just can't execute because the mailer's behind or because they're so their queue's so full or there's hey legal review still has to go on, right? Because it's a giveaway. It has to have review. So you can see where the iterations that we are had were, hey, there's that initial push in December, then there's the next push that we had in January. We changed it up a little bit. We did some tactical pause because there were other campaigns that we had running in March. Right, and then we did it the whole swing into, hey, it's getting ready for the summer season. And that's where you can see we were able to get the mailer in there, right? Where that's a nice, pleasant surprise when they open it up to your point, Jan. Um, and then you can see where it really took off, right? And that's where we had a lot of participants come into the program at that point. A lot of those offers getting accepted. Um, so it's a perfect chart to go and see as you iterate, you're gonna get more and more value out of that iteration, right? Don't just do one thing one time. Yeah, I think to add on to that, kind of two things that this slide shows me. One, if a utility program falls in the forest, nobody hears it. Uh, as you can see, the spikes, the peaks, and the valleys, those valleys, the offer is still valid and still people can still participate in it, right? So, like, this is a testament to why you have to have multiple touch points with consumers. I think in, you know, in the consumer e-commerce world, you have to engage with somebody eight times before they're like, yeah, I, I want that thing. So, I know a lot of times with utility programs, we send out one email or you put out one newsletter, or you talk about it one time, that just literally doesn't do it. Like someone has to hear it several times. The other thing to note is by having that one-time code, you can actually control the flow of enrollments because there is a one-to-one -one correlation between what you're sending out. So like if you do have finite budgets, that's actually a really good way for you to make sure that you prescriptively stay within those budgets if you, if you want to, um, and you don't have anything that goes viral and you kind of lose control of it. Yeah, one of the things that we needed to do in here was, you know, get in there and brainstorm, right? And one of the things that we tried to find in vendors is a vendor who could set up a one-time site for us, do it in such a way where we didn't have to charge for shipping, we didn't have to charge for taxes, we didn't have some sort of little, you know, clawback feature or whatever, right? Especially with the demographic we're going um, towards, we wanted to make it very seamless and easy. And I think Technarit was able to do that where we had poked around, looked for vendors for, I mean, I wouldn't say years, but it was almost that to go out there and find a vendor that can do something that's unique like this, right? Make it very seamless for the customer, uh, make it easy on our back end, right? For billing and invoicing, but also for tracking and how many, you know, where these are at, be able to provide the technical support that the customer needs with a call center of their own. Um, Right, because we don't want to put everything on our residential call center because that's something that is is unique, right? Our residential call center is set up to support very technical things, but the call volume for certain things, right? Um, it's best left sometimes to the vendor, right? Because we need our RCC trying to go and keep those scores high, keep our customer service up, and then have the technical experts be on the phone. I think that's was something that TA did for us and, and continues to do. Um, I think that's important to understand is that you, you got to look at your vendors, see what they can and can't do and find the right one for you. And I think TA did a great job for us. There's a lot of coordination between partners to get this set up as well, right? It's your point. Like it's a very unique offering in the sense that the consumer never has to whip out a debit or a credit card. 
It's completely free. So that means that taxes had to be covered, which means that legal had to be looped in to make sure that you can give away something and cover the taxes. And then like shipping had to be taken care of. So then you got to work with the distributors, et cetera. So between like Energy Hub and Techni Art, Resource Innovations, um, SRP and Google, we had to collectively work together to figure out like who can cover what component of that, who has subject matter experts who can provide an answer for a certain part of it to make sure that it's, you know, above board and everything's going to be good and that we don't have any regulatory issues kind of moving forward, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot of that upfront coordination and ensuring that we all had a involvement in different aspects of it and were able to support it in different ways and bring value to the table in different ways really helped streamline the process once we got going. Quote my marketing guru, Mark, who says easy for the customer is hard. And it takes a lot of thought, takes a lot of coordination. But uh, with this team, I think we were able to do that and create a process that they can get through without a lot of pain. That's the goal. Yep. Um, goal is to make Amazon Prime look hard. Yeah. Look at those beautiful people. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all for explaining really the process of how you streamline the approach to connect with those customers. Again, really like convert them to a participant in the demand response program. So, so with that, now we'll open it up to questions. Um, so everyone feel free to drop your questions in the chat and, and we'll try to get to them um, as best we can here. Now, again, you guys talked a lot about lessons learned throughout the discussion here and i've answered some questions in the chat um are you able to expand um on how you also reached out to multifamily and small business customers uh to tap into those segments through this effort yeah so we run separate unique programs at srp for those uh, efforts. So we have a program through ICF that does multifamily installations where we work with the uh, owner, property manager, maintainer, right, to go and get free kits through TechniArt. Uh, I shouldn't say kits, excuse me. Those are thermostats in bulk order that those multifamily owner operators can go and um, have an agreement, get signed. We pay for it. Um, they'll in fact even get reimbursed if they go and have a professional installer go out. Sometimes they, most of the majority of the time they use their on-site maintenance uh, personnel because they're used to gaining entry to those um, and provide the correct notification, things like that, right, to the customer to gain entry and complete the installation. So we have a separate program that runs through there with the assistance of Technic Art and Google on that one. Um, and then we have a different one. Um, for small business that we also run through um, actually resource innovations, the, the, the parent company to Techni Art. Um, we do that through our smart business and that's totally free. So we have like a $400 rebate for installation thermostat itself and everything that we run through. And we coordinate all of those enrollments into the program through um, Energy Hub, right? So if you look at it, again, we're trying to meet every single customer where they're at to be able to go and get there, whether that's a small business, whether that's a multifamily customer, which provides a different opportunity, right? Because you have to have the owner operator install it. I can't go and suggest to a customer, please go and install this on a property you don't own. Um, you know, rules and laws and real estate regulations come into play there. Um, so we have to always make and, com and comply to those to Tyson's earlier point, right? But we offer something to each individual segment of um, customer out there. And to, in addition to that, so from the Google side, we've helped provide some thought leadership and some best practices on kind of the program design related to that. One of the things that we're fortunate to do is we work with hundreds of utilities across the country for a variety of different programs. So we have an opportunity to see like what works really well, what doesn't work. We're able to pull from that and curate like the best of the best and provide those insights and best practices out to our partners we work with. Um, so we did some of that in, in the instances for both multifamily as well as for small business. In addition to that, we actually have a community of uh, HVAC installers um, that participate in the Nest Pro program that Google offers um, that provides incentives to HVAC contractors who install Nest products. So we actually did training sessions with those folks on SRP's programs such that when they were in the wild, either doing multifamily installs or doing small business installs, they would actually be equipped to help convince folks to enroll in these programs as well. To try to promote, like expand the reach that the utility has when it's trying to go to market. So it's another best practice is tap your vendors. Like 
everybody wants everyone to be successful. There's no reason why we should operate in silos. We all have different opportunities to support in various ways. So work with all the vendors that you have to identify, hey, can you tap resources that we don't have access to because we don't have those capabilities that can expand the way that we're kind of uh, reaching out to these various groups that we traditionally haven't had a lot of success reaching out to. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing those approaches and really highlighting that uh, using those resources to the, the best of your ability to create success for a program is, is really important. Now, of course, we've talked about those techniques to present the program to customers, reach out to them, show them the benefits, um, and really start to engage with them so they make they take that step to actually request the thermostat, request the kit. Now, what happens when a customer receives that and they don't install a thermostat? How do you connect with those customers to make sure that once they get it, they continue their journey from installing it um, and enrolling in the program? Speak to that a little bit. I mean, you can take it first. I'm happy to, to lay her in. Yeah, why don't you take it first and then um, okay. I'll yeah. jump back in. Here you're, so you're right, thought. Nick. Yeah. Not, not everybody installs at the same time. Um, I've personally been involved in kind of let's call them DIY programs for 10 years, 15. I'm getting old, man, 17 years now. Um, and what I've learned over my multiple decades as a geriatric millennial is that everybody kind of does things in their own time horizon. I know we have this expectation that like once you receive a thing, you immediately do it. But if you put your like own personal, how do I do things around my house hat, you realize that everyone has a to-do list and they get reprioritized kind of constantly dynamically, right? So you've got a tranche of folks that we've identified over the years who immediately install within like a week of getting it. They've been like waiting for it. They've been tracking it via FedEx to see like when it's going to come. They like met the dude at the front door once the package arrived. Then you've got this kind of second tranche of folks who they typically do it in the first month or so. They've got other priorities, probably got kids at home, they got stuff going on. So they get to it kind of whenever time allows for it. Um, and then you've got kind of two more tranches. You've got folks who install within like three to six months, less of a priority for them and something reminds them that this is a thing I should do. They could have received a high bill or they could have seen additional marketing material about it that reminded them, oh, I actually took advantage of that. I need to go do the thing. And then you got this kind of last tranche of folks. This is the one that's most challenging. And I think we'll have a lot of uh, learnings from this program that we're trying to help support this moving forward is the folks who they just kind of fall off. They've received the thermostat three, six months. They still haven't installed it. At that point, you've kind of got these drip campaigns that Eamon and, and Jim can talk to where we've been engaging with these consumers over a period of time. And then you kind of gradually increase the level of effort that you're willing to provide those consumers to ensure that the device gets installed. So like on the front end, you got the folks who again will just do it themselves. Nothing else is needed. Once they receive it, they're going to do it themselves. Then you've got folks that take a little while. It may take an additional email to remind them that they got this thing and need to install. Then you got folks who actually need help in some capacity. So that's where the installation support page comes in. That's where calling into the call center to get technical support from NASA or from others comes into play. Then you got this last tranche of folks who were really confident in their capabilities. And then when it came down to it, they're like, I'm not doing that. Uh, so someone's got to do it for me. So that's when you have to find ways that are alternative to that to get the thermostat on the wall. That could be through trade allies. That could be through third parties, et cetera. So, yeah, and we're, thought, we're looking at different approaches um as to how we're going to be able to help that we sent out a really extensive this is a short survey but it had a big impact on learning about the installations the reason why people aren't installing the you know do they need a wiring adapter how do we improve um the instructions there what do we put in for the the actual insert into the box right um for installation instructions right some people just were like oh i didn't even want the thermostat i just wanted the rest of the kit so we've made a lot of different changes um over time um, some of them have kind of, you know, gone back and forth, right? Kind of flip flopping a little bit, but that's just the nature of the program is to trying to answer that. And we're looking at right now, looking at um, a partnership with about 30% of the customers out there. We know um, about a third that are going to need some sort of professional installation help. So we're looking at how do we do that in a way um, that meets the customer where they're at, but also incidentally, you know, structures it in such a way right where we can go and provide the installation support without um long-term liability right we want to go and make sure that um, we're always maintaining that customer service at the highest level possible it's very 
challenging, but uh, that's probably the next iteration of where we're at with the program itself is being able to help with that professional installation service, and we're working on that. And I would just add that, like, I think to everyone's point, like, constant communication um, and education kind of upfront when a customer gets that device installed is really important to their, like, continued engagement with the program and staying enrolled. So Energy Hub is kind of looking at different ways that we can kind of um, build a communication journey, sort of doing like a welcome email, a mid-season checkpoint. Um, also, SRP sends out um, event notifications when they schedule events so customers know what to expect, meaning like what's going to happen during the event, when is it going to be, what's going to be the behavior of the you know, event parameters for the event so that customers just have as much information up front as they possibly can. Um, and also just in like illustrating what the benefits of the program are outside of obviously the free thermostat. Things like the annual participation incentive, which is $25 per thermostat, um, and just also what the benefits, you know, from a community standpoint are not only for the grid, but just sort of like doing their part to help, you know, keep the lights on and reduce um, impact on the grid. So just keeping that front and center for the customer, I think is also really helpful. Jesse, yeah. just on the constant, oh, sorry, Eamon, I was going to su suggest on the, on the constant communication piece, one thing that we did learn is we changed marketing tactics to include uh, email, direct mail with a postcard and then a postcard stuffed in an envelope. And then we transitioned over to the drip campaign and that was largely based on email only. So Amy made a good point about meeting customers where they are. And that's a that's an important part when you're communicating with a vast array of customers on the market. And we sort of funneled everything into this digital platform for the drip campaign. And that was probably an error that we learned about pretty quickly and said we need to get to customers and in the same way that they participated the first time, we should be reminding them to install the device or to survey them and find out why they wouldn't install the device. The device. So I just wanted to make that and point. I think subsequently, we're in the process of conducting a direct mail campaign out to those folks who responded via direct mail communication, to your point, such that um, we're reaching people in the method that they prefer to be communicated with. and. I think that was a valid uh, acknowledgement as well as that we initially didn't think through that we would need to have a kind of analog drip campaign along with the, the digital one. Yeah, and another question that came up here. Um, so these customers are the same as any other customer, how we treat them when they're once they're enrolled, right? So um, there is no, you know, hook let's just say, other than installing the thermostat, right, once they're actually enrolled, they're treated as the same customer, right, to be very clear, whether they're a small business customer, whether they're the, uh, the one-time offer kit customer, whether they're a regular participant that purchased a thermostat from Best Buy and then went and came into the program, right, or got something in the mail um, from their friends or family, right, and somebody being really generous and a uh, thermostat over. No matter how it happens, so they can always opt out of an event, right? So either due to customer comfort, convenience, whatever the case may be, right? Um, they can put it in the first hour and come out the second hour, right? However, it's going to work for them, right? They can always opt out. They can unenroll out of the program. They're not going to get charged back or clawed back whatsoever for the kit or the thermostat itself, right? They're going to get the same incentive that um, I would get or anybody else that comes into the program. So they'll get $50. For once they install the thermostat, um, have it enrolled, connected to Wi-Fi, all of the, the standards that need to be met in terms of just being a participant in the program, right? Um, they'll get that eligible up to two, so hard limit of, of two uh, thermostats, so they can get up to $100 initial and bill credit, and then after the season closes on October 31st, we go through and see everybody that's uh, an active participant, still connected and enrolled in the program, and we'll per, uh, process their $25 annual incentive limited up to two, um, and they usually receive that within about 30 days uh, post uh, event close for that summer. And then, uh, yeah, so treated no differently. Does that and answer your question? Good. I'm sorry, yeah, I was making sure I was answering that question. One, of, one of the interesting things that Techniart did with uh, the platform itself is putting themselves in the consumer's perspective. Um, 
by having some of those questions already answered up front on the page, really easy to find. Like it's impossible to avoid them, right? Instead of it being in a drop down box somewhere else, it's just go search for, making it very abundantly clear. Like the first thing is step one, check compatibility. So it's like, should I even pursue this? And then from there, it's put my code in. And if I have any like lingering questions, here's some answers to those questions and also an off ramp to go talk to a human. Um, that enables you to ensure that once folks are actually in the program and they've been installed, attrition rates remain low. Um, a lot of the times the people who complain about DR programs are people who've never participated in DR programs. People who actually participate in the programs have no problem with them the majority of the time because once they're in them, they realize I can't opt out if I'm ever inconvenienced, which typically doesn't happen. So I think a lot of the times, unfortunately, the loudest people in the, in the room are the folks who never actually do the thing to begin with. And that's something we have to take into consideration. Yeah, those are great points. Oh, thanks for explaining that. Another question that's coming up here is is related to opt outs. Um, so are customers allowed to opt out during events? And do you typically see a lot of opt out? Yeah, it's no different um, so far as we can see in terms of their actual participation within the program. Um, you know, realistically, uh, most people sometimes don't even notice in that first hour unless they check their email or look on their device, right? Um, and then that's when, you know, typically people start to see that. So, but to be honest, um, we haven't dived into, is their petition patient any more or less valuable than say um, a conventional thermostat customer that comes into the program, right? Um, and frankly, Honestly, looking at it from that perspective is probably a little disingenuous, in my opinion, because the goal is to get people participating in the program where they can, right? And everybody's going to be different, right? My comfort level versus somebody else's, you know, what do I have going on that day versus some other day, right? Um, every customer is going to be different and unique. So I think trying to really break it down, you know, any better than that. I don't know. I don't think that's the point of the why we're doing these programs, right? Because ultimately we're doing these programs to give options to our residential customers or multifamily, small business, whoever they can, we're eligible to participate, right? Um, and meet them where they're at. Again, I keep saying this and you know, Tyson backs me up on this and I, and I know others on the call do too, but our goal is to be able to go and provide as many megawatts to our trading team as possible so we can maintain reliable and hopefully inexpensive um, you know electrical hookup to these customers right and that goes for everybody right no matter who it is whoever comes into the program it's agnostic in that way and that's how we run our events too is, is totally agnostic we don't try to go and group certain people together. Now we do do different things for customers that are on demand charge programs or some of our solar customers. That's very different, right? Um, but that's kind of the point of the call today to talk about that particular subset of customer because they have a different set of demands. Yeah, we typically only run two hour events, Jan. Um, we did run some three hour events a few seasons ago. We don't do that anymore. We learned that it's just one for our climate um it's just not going to work right it's it's a bit too long of an event in fact um any customer starts coming off their hva system is cycling pretty hard at that point so anything more than two hours for arizona's climate um, typically do doesn't work yeah and the devices they do ship uh pre-enrolled so that's one of the we kind of glanced over that but um something that not not every utility takes advantage of today is the fact that um, we do have technical technol we have technical APIs and integrations in place in the back end between Energy Hub, Techniar, Google, SRP, and a lot of the other partners that enable us to do what the eye chart was showing earlier with the duck that's kind of you know losing its mind beneath the water. That's all the stuff that's happening to have those ones and zeros flow appropriately such that when the device shows up in the customer's home, they actually don't have to do anything outside of what they would have already done, which is install the thermostat. Everything else is taken care of uh, on their behalf. So it is significantly streamlined both from a user experience on the platform, um, personalized from a marketing and outreach perspective, and then streamlined on a, how do we actually get this thing enrolled, installed, and, and kind of helping helping support kind of demand flexibility. Five hours is a lot. 
Yeah, we 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 found that uh, maybe because it's a, you know it can be 119, 120 degrees on a very hottest days here. Um, I, I I personally wouldn't participate in a program. <laughs> My wife would not approve of a five-hour event, and I run DR programs. No. Um, as far as prequel, yes, we prequel customers again. That's based on their price plan, right? A lot of those customers that are on demand charge programs, we do not prequel for very obvious reasons. Um, you know, that in, and if they want a prequel, they can typically do it themselves. So we sent out a lot of communication against so that kind of what this this particular presentation is about today. But to, to help answer that question, that is one that we actually zoom in quite a lot on with Energy Hub and how we work with that. Um, but again, kind of outside the scope of that with this presentation is today. But feel free to hit me up. I'll yeah, you, you can hit us all up. Make it work. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for explaining that. And just uh, sir, 60 minute prequel, Julia. Awesome. Thanks. You guys are making my job easy. You guys are hitting all these questions <laughs> as they're coming through. <laughs> um, just to, to quickly circle back to a question a little bit earlier um, related to marketing strategies. You guys have talked a lot about how you've really tried to customize the experience to meet the customer where they're at. Eamon, you said that earlier, and you've built so many different avenues to be able to do that and meet the customer's needs. Um, throughout that process, are you able to share the types of marketing strategies, materials, or really information you put in front of the customer that proved to be really successful in converting them to a participant? I think that was directed to Eamon, but I think any one of us could probably help answer that question. Yeah. I was going to tag team that with you, Tyson, because yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. to be honest, they're, they're, they're sort of uh, the brains of the operation. And I would say uh, Tyson, Tyson is our guy for that. All beard, um, no brains. Um, so, <laughs> uh, again, not as illustrious of a beard as Eamon has, but uh, I'm crushing Jim right now. So, I'm, you know, I'm kind of in the middle of that. Um, so, from a marketing perspective, unfortunately, Mark, uh, who, you know, Chief Marketing Officer for Techni Art, um, he helped with a lot of kind of the market marketing design, but effectively we really used e-commerce principles. So I know a lot of times, you know, putting my old, having worked at a utility hat on, the fun thing to do is to put as much information into the materials as possible. Cause you're like, I got one go at this, right? If I got one swing at bat, I'm putting mm -hmm. everything I got into it. What that does is it overwhelms people or it makes it really easy to be recycled. Um, so they see that information and they don't do anything with it. it has to be completely distilled down to, a very clear, compelling offer and a call to action and a way to facilitate that. From a direct mail perspective, that was again initially a direct mail piece that had a very uh, pretty image, had very clear and concise copy so that people could easily identify what it was they were being asked to do and how they could go about doing it. And then the critical piece is it had a vanity URL so that you didn't have to type a really long URL with your tiny fingers on your tiny phone. Um, or a QR code so that you could even skip the whole got to type stuff part and you can just scan it. So by doing that, you see a significant amount of people who will immediately jump from direct mail online. Uh, and that's critical because it makes it actionable. You know, historically, direct mail is something that sat on your kitchen counter and collected dust for quite some time before you finally decided to go figure out how to actually do it. But now you can do it walking back from the mailbox. Um, so direct mail piece is one similarly with the form letter. Again, wrapping it in the authority that is the utilities envelope, also including a QR code, also including a vanity URL, but having a little bit more real estate to actually dig into like the reason why the program exists. So you should use each of those tactics differently. Direct mail, that's a postcard. Keep it simple. If you want to have more elaborate kind of information that you share, you could use the form letter. It also has an increase in performance because of that authority impact. But then you need to reinforce that with digital marketing from an email perspective. Um, you can also do like press releases and other things, get the local media involved so that you can kind of create like a surround sound marketing campaign such that you can easily get those eight mentions to the consumer such that they eventually are like, fine, I'll do it. And then they go and they're like, oh my God, it's actually amazing. Why didn't I listen the first seven times that they told me to do this? Yeah, and to piggyback on Tyson's point is one of the things that we're actually looking at right now is working with some of the third party agencies out there that represent certain demographic groups, right? So we're doing some outreach through another partner at ICF that we have a uh, home energy assessment program kind of tying together all these things that we can do is that, you know, if you have a group that is helping out Hispanic customers, great, 
let's push all this information to them so they can get it out to their community mailers to their email list right um, in there and it, we split the, our service territory with APS as well so some of that you know we can hand over to them we have a great working relationship with APS everybody on this call actually works with APS in some manner or, or shape right because you're going to have these two utilities that are sometimes in the same city um, you know one across the street from each other literally <laughs> my dad's side of the street he's APS and the other side of the street it's it's SRP right um, so no matter what with this is that we're able to go and meet them uh, one of the other thing is how do you, would you determine to get a coupon code we kind of talked about that very early on but it's a good time to go and reemphasize that so we looked at every single customer residentially right um, that was a non renter multifamily customer because there's a separate program for them they have to be approached in a whole different manner because i can't go and advocate for them to install a device on a property that they don't own right um, but there's a separate program for multifamily for that particular demographic customer we have a separate program as well that we do for small business customers so any customer that we have about 1.1 million residential meters we went down to every customer that was in a hud census tract zip code that was considered low income by census track data and verified by HUD and all this can be pulled down off of those websites right from from the um, their respective government agencies right um, so we looked at that and so we had our map team look at those customers we had our map team also identify customers that were self-identified as low income so we have an economy price plan um, and and then in there we just zoomed in as best we could and open it up. We ended up getting to a list that about had about 108,000 customers that met those criteria, right? But again, with the mind of making it as open as we possibly can, getting it all out there. And then we emailed those customers that so we had the list. I think we have a, 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 about 80% email penetration off of that list. So we sent those early emails. We did those mailers. Um, of course, then we went to the envelope program. So that's how we got to who was eligible to get that coupon code. We also made some coupon codes um, to customers that called in and heard about it, right? And if they happened to go and meet those uh, pre-qualification standards that we had to set internally, right? Um, we were had those available to those customers as well. So some pre-coded uh, there that uh, Jim was able to work with us and Mark to unlock some coupon codes to, to make it not just address specific. So Kevin, to your question, um, from a Wi-Fi perspective, you actually need, so we, we intentionally chose a Google Nest device that requires Wi-Fi in order for it to provide all the smart capabilities. One of the main reasons for that is because it is a demand response program, so it probably should be connected to the internet. Um, so by choosing a device that will default to only offering up all the capabilities and benefits when it's connected to Wi-Fi, helps self-select the folks who are actually gonna be able to install the device and connect it to Wi-Fi appropriately. But, but also a, an educational piece is now there's a, a blatant question that we're going to be asking participating customers: Do you have Wi-Fi? It's it seems very simple and like you wouldn't need to do that, but uh, we've learned that it's it's just a necessary step to make sure that we filter our customers that couldn't use the device the way it's intended. Jim, do you want to talk about um, the, those couple of changes we did with the initial? Uh, questions like say, hey, make the statement that do you have a working HVAC system? Do you have um, connected Wi-Fi, right? Um, the couple of things to just prompt customers to look uh, and see before they do order, because we learn in that survey, uh, but I'll, I'll let you kind of talk to that here, Jim. Yeah, um, again, I thought the, the survey that SRP did was really well done, and it was just to identify customers who or to identify why customers had not yet installed. And one of them was, I don't have Wi-Fi. I don't have a working air conditioning system. And those seem like automatic prerequisites that we didn't necessarily need to dig into, but you do. It's just, we have to, we have to understand uh, what the criteria are that customers need to participate and then tell them, explain it clearly to them. So we now ask that as part of the uh, filtering process when they land on the page. The second part of it is I, not necessarily something that has to be identified up front, but once they get it, if they do have other challenges, getting it installed, helping them get through those challenges. So the installation support page has more detailed um, resources accessible to the customers, like 
a link to YouTube videos on how to install a Google thermostat, uh, a compatibility, an additional link to the compatibility checker to make sure that they have potentially the C-wire adapter that's required to put the device in their home. Uh, or if they really do need help with professional installation, let's identify those folks and um, help get them to the right resources, which is another initiative that Eamon is now trying to tackle in his spare time. So um, hopefully we, we can identify uh, not only why customers don't install, but then put them into these individual categories and help find the ways to address their needs to finish the process and get them fully participating. And then reincorporate re that back into program design moving forward, right? Exactly. So to your point, you've, the Technic Resource Innovations team has already taken a lot of that feedback from the survey and reincorporated it into the platform itself such that anybody else who participates uh, now has, you know, a lot of that has been exposed such that if they don't qualify for one of those reasons, they're not more aware of it. Um, another yeah. thing that's beneficial to note is because these devices are DR pre-enrolled, for a period of time, like let's say hypothetically there someone's air conditioner does break, right? They they go to install it and realize actually my air conditioner is broken to begin with. Um, so can't install that. In six months from now, if they install the device, it would still enroll itself in the DR program because it is a DR pre-enrolled device. You do have a shelf life that you can still, uh, if there's something that mm -hmm. is you know preventing the customer from getting it installed, as long as you're able to eventually get it installed, it still auto enrolls itself in the DR program. Yeah, something that we want to kind of point out that made this um, a great program in a lot of ways that we could literally have a conference call with a few of the members of this team, um, especially when we had calls with TA that Mark and that team at the TA side with Jim could literally we say, hey, we don't want to do this. We, we need to add this question. They could have that updated on the one time offer site either that day or the next day have the wire diagram. Hey, do you approve? What do you think of this language? And the delay was always on our end, right? With saying, oh, I got to go and have my marketing person look at this. Oh, I got to go and run that past legal real quick. But I kid you not, we could literally have those changes and updates and that iteration done within less than 24 hours from the TA side. And it reflected right back over to the customer where they clicked on it. So if you think about that, like how many times you may have asked your vendor, hey, can I get this changed? Yeah, we'll get around to it, right? Like I don't need to draw a circle and say round to it on it and then hand it to them say hey can you get around to it anytime never had to do that with with you know any of the parties involved on here they were always waiting on us and still do wait on us unfortunately just the nature of the beast right the speedy but, utility, man. <laughs> yeah but if you think about it right how many changes that we probably made to the front end taking feedback from our residential call center we have a specific support center called connected home team they're on these calls right how many we probably made over a weekly conference call each time we probably have accumulated like 40 or 50 different changes that we've made to the site all to try to keep learning and, and getting feedback and then of course you have overlaps from the multifamily program you have overlaps from small business you have overlaps from a home energy assessment kits program i mean it unfortunately it does kind of step into each other's territory but we've had to make those changes within those weeks because oh we're getting a lot of phone calls from this customer they're not even supposed to be in that program right it's because it's overlaying mm. and overlapping sometimes to frustration um and hopefully not frustration from the customer but when we did have frustration from the customer we went in and made that change um and that but i would children. challenge anybody yeah i would challenge anybody to try to um when you're when you're looking at your vendors right and this isn't necessarily tooting their their own horns but you need to be able to find that kind of quality where they want to do it. They're there for you. They're supporting the program because ultimately it's about getting these thermostats into the hands of the customers, getting the right installation participants to hopefully lower down their energy cost. Right. It's the number one driver for people um, nowadays. And, and if we can get them these where just by having it installed, not even participating in DR, typically in Arizona, you get about $45 per year by putting a Google Nest on your wall or some sort of smart thermostat, just an energy efficiency savings. Um, but then you get the incentives, then you get the participation in that program. Um, and it has bigger and bigger impacts as you look at it, right? Yeah, and like once that thermostat's installed, like let's say somebody does enroll, unenroll. It's not like you've lost that person forever. Um, all the OEMs, including Google Nest, we send frequent communication to all of our users hey, you're missing out on these rewards that you, sh you could be receiving. 
So there's a good likelihood that they will eventually enroll back in the program. But again, it comes down to education. They need to understand it enough to be comfortable in maintaining their uh, participation in the program. But to Eamon's point, like agility is key uh, because we can build these things in vacuums all you want, but once they're released to the public, we immediately start seeing iterative needs that need to be adjusted. And so making sure that you have the partners who do have the ability to you know, adjust the speed to market and they can be willing and participants in adopting different technologies and different ways of going about things to help meet the needs of the consumers is really critical because it enables you to have a product that isn't static and that is evolving with consumers' behaviors and needs. Just to continue the hug fest for one more moment, I just want to say it's fantastic partnering with a group like SRP. Like he talked about some delays that those are inevitable, but I think the ability for Eamon and his team at SRP to understand their customer base helps us be more effective on the e-commerce side because we're making effective changes to positively impact the customer base and make the process and, and experience a more positive one for them. So I just, you know, quick applaud to those guys for understanding who their customers are and what their real needs are. Because it's, what I the, wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's you didn't, perfectly didn't say you like me. I just need to be clear there. Let the record reflect that Jim said that he enjoyed participating, like helping with Eamon. Did not say Tyson, did not say Google, did not say Energy Hub. Yeah, and even then, I think there's times where Jim's probably texted me um, and just been like, dude, what up? Like, what what, what happened here? So look, you know, it, not every program is just sunshine and roses, right? I think that's what we're trying to emphasize, that every single program, um, especially when you're trying to reach a demographic that has different needs from what you're typically encountering in the past is that it, it's it's on you to follow all the way through, right? Just don't say, oh, we tried and then just let it go. Um, I don't think anybody on this call has just went and said, eh, that's good enough. Um, you know, and you got to look at yourself at the end of the day. Did you do everything right? Um, you know, and sometimes we've had to make hard calls that say, well, uh, we can't do this because it's stepping on this other customer's toes right or it's it's eating into this and has there been like uh consternation behind that 100 percent. but that's what leadership is about it's about you know making those tough decisions sometimes and uh trying to do what's best for all of your programs right and all of your customers to go and uh meet them where they're at yeah absolutely uh thank you all so much for sharing that and really showing how you've all worked together to just create such a successful program and reach those hard to reach customers. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it back to Judy to close out this dialogue. Thank you so much, Meg. And thank you so much, Eamon Yuri from Salt River Project, Tyson Brown from Google Nest, Jim Walsh from Techniart Resource Innovations, and Jesse Guest of Energy Hub for really such an in-depth and compelling conversation. There is so much in here to dig into and to think about. Uh, so we really appreciate your willingness to share this information with everybody. And Meg, thank you so much for moderating today's conversation. And so moving on, uh, we will invite everybody here to access today's webinar or share it with a colleague um, through PLMA's Load Management Dialogue podcast, which you can download from wherever you get your podcasts. In addition, if you would like to re-watch this whole recording, we will have it uploaded to PLMA's YouTube channel in the next few days, and it will be there, uh, so available to anyone who's interested. And in addition, if you enjoyed this webinar, uh, wanted to let you know PLMA has many other webinars uh, coming up. If you go to the PLMA calendar, you'll see additional opportunities. Um, one of our next ones is on October 12th, and this is going to be a webinar that's really just for PLMA members. So you will need to join us uh, to participate, but this one will be about closing the decarbonization gap with flexible load management and distributed intelligence. So think about that one. That should be very interesting. Following that on October the 25th, we'll be exploring mitigating climate change with a panel that will be moderated by a special guest who is Lee Cravat of the podcast, The Climate Champions, uh, also available on PLMA's calendar. And last of all, I wanted to draw your attention to next week's training. We will be doing PLMA's live online class. It's called The Evolution of DR to DERs. It's taught by a great team of experienced PLMA practitioners, 
It's two half days, so it's uh, afternoon of the Wednesday and Thursday. It goes very quickly and it offers a wonderful, rich learning opportunity. It's super interactive and you will gain a lot from everything in that program. So strongly recommend that it's available also on our calendar. And then last but not least, uh, the 48th PLMA conference is coming up in November. It'll be held in Charlotte. And of course, this will be our biggest conference ever. We say that each time. Uh, however, there are going to be lots and lots of very interesting topics and conversations, productive networking opportunities, and of course, uh, all kinds of fun meeting with colleagues and friends from across North America and beyond. So we encourage everybody to join us for that. And we'll go to our wrap up and say thank you for joining us today. You have been listening to a load management dialogue presented by PLMA. To learn more about upcoming dialogues and for an archive of past recordings, please visit us at peakload.org or your favorite podcast platform. And this concludes this edition. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Good to see you here today. Bye for thank now. You.